He's a medical doctor who wears many hats. Scientist, inventor, technologist, media proprietor and philanthropist. Building a network of interests devoted to the transformation of healthcare that has seen his estimated net worth exceed $10 billion. With a big announcement this week. We as an organization will commit an initial 3 billion rand uh, to catalyze uh, this activity in South Africa and then work with Africa so that um, the capacity and most important second generation vaccinology, second generation cell therapy, uh, second generation uh, delivery systems uh, could be en enabled. I also need to say that beyond COVID, we need to worry about diseases like schistosomiasis, tropical diseases that have been neglected because they're African, um, cancer like Burkitt's lymphoma, HIV. And one of the most urgent things is this non-infectious epidemic called cancer. The survival rates in, in Africa is terrible. So with that, um, I just want to announce that our goal uh, and our commitment is to come back to South Africa and transfer this kind of technology. Dr. Sun Xiong's other company, Immunity Bio, is already conducting vaccine clinical trials in South Africa in partnership with a local vaccine producer, BioVac. He says he's been in talks with Professor Tulio de Oliveira of the KZN Research Innovation and Sequencing Platform, Dr. Glenda Gray of the SA Medical Research Council and the South African government, and says he believes the country has the science, human capital, capacity, and desire that can catalyze self-sufficiency and innovation in Africa on the question of vaccine development and production. He points to intellectual property waiver negotiations at the World Trade Organization as a key step, but not the only consideration moving forward as countries seek to position themselves as second generation COVID-19 vaccine providers. What is really needed is second generation vaccines. But there's also a need for broad platform, whether it be viral vector platform, RNA platform, cell therapy platform, antibody platform, um, subunit platforms, adjuvants. My um, commitment and goal is to bring these platforms into Africa. And when we say Africa can, Africa will, Already in South Africa, we will have and do have companies like Vivac, companies like Aspen. Um, while South Africa has not in its own right built a vaccine since 2001, that will change. Offering to bring and transfer new technologies that could lead to South Africa becoming a vaccine powerhouse in Africa. I think more important or as important than the IP wavering is the issue of the transfer of real know-how. To me, what's exciting is vaccinology has now evolved mm -hmm. from egg-based vaccines to now modernized genomics. And as you know, South Africa has led the way in terms of genomic analysis. South Africa has led the way in terms of understanding the danger of these variants. Um, I don't think the world yet recognized that these current variants, especially the now the variant in India, and started initially uh, the variant in South Africa has what we call confirmational change. Antibodies are going to be less effective. Among his multiple claims to fame, he's the inventor of the drug Abraxane, which became known for its efficacy against lung, breast and pancreatic cancer. Think about what you could do, you have a lifetime ahead of you. Soon Xiong proving to be a key resource as the country seeks to build back better post COVID-19. Shervin Bryceby's SABC News, New York. So for many countries like ours, vaccine manufacturing cap uh, capability is a new frontier and collaborations like the one with Dr. Soon Xiong will be key to building and fortifying that capacity. For more, let's uh, chat to our U.S. correspondent, Sherwin Bryce Pease, uh, who is in New York and now live for us. Uh, Sherwin, it sounds very exciting. Just explain a little bit more. Why is this investment such a big deal? 
Well, it's 3 billion rand, 210 million dollars. So just from a, an economic point of view, it's a massive investment. But Francis, in the context of building back better, when we talk about countries like South Africa becoming self-sufficient in terms of any future pandemics, this is what it looks like when the rubber hits the road, right? This is the types of partnerships in terms of uh, uh, transferring know-how, the exchange of technology that is going to be able to fortify a country like South Africa, build up its capacity for any future pandemics. Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Owiala, the Director General of the World Trade Organization, was also part of this WHO meeting on equitable access where this big announcement was made. And she talked about the three things that need to be happening to ensure that countries like South Africa and other developing countries are able to fortify themselves for the future. This is what she said. We need to advance the negotiation in the TRIPS Council, as I just mentioned, on the waiver. Uh, but we also need to remember all the other aspects of, of uh, getting vaccines into arms. Uh, it's, for me, it's always a three-part solution. The uh, supply chain, facilitating the supply chain through the export restrictions, which my members uh, have the capacity of doing. Uh, it is talking with manufacturers and matchmaking as we're trying to do now, uh, because we need that capacity, both in the short to medium term, but also in the longer term. And then is the technology transfer and including the IP waiver. Those three things all have to come together in order for us to, to make progress. That's why I'm also calling on vaccine manufacturers to make concrete moves to scale up manufacturing. So, Francis, Dr. Ngozi talking about the three things that need to happen, the three-part solution. Supply chain constraints need to be dealt with. Manufacturers and matchmaking needs to happen. And, of course, the technology transfer of the type you're seeing in terms of the Dr. Uh, uh, Soon uh, Xiong and, and, and this uh, $210 million investment. But earlier this week, we did a story about uh, the latest UN World Economic Situation and Prospects report. And they talk about how vaccine uh, distribution and administering in countries Countries like the United States and countries like China is, you know, is going to see growth of 6.4% and 8.2% respectively. And so Ngozi also talks about the fact that uh, va this is not just about vaccine equity. This is also about economic equity and the economic advantages that can come in terms of the medium and short term. If South Africa, for example, is able to build up its vaccine manufacturing and supply capacity and what that could mean for the SADC region and the, the Africa region in terms of a possible future vaccine power. House in our region. Yeah, and, and we need that help. We are one of the, the regions that are being left behind, like, like you say. So the focus remaining on those negotiations, uh, what she was talking about, the IP waiver in the TRIPS Council of the WTO. And I understand South Africa is calling for um, text-based negotiations. But, but right now, it's anyone's guess. Do we know where it's all going? Right, a lot of excitement, uh, you know, with the announcement last week from the United States that they are now ready to engage in the uh, possible uh, intellectual property waivers in the TRIPS Council uh, at the WTO. But it's not a sure bet where these negotiations will end. We are now hearing that the European Union is prepared to come to the table. We understand that countries like Japan and New Zealand are open to negotiation. But it doesn't necessarily mean that all IP wa uh, waivers as it relates to vaccine supply and distribution will be done away with. We understand understand that there is some vehement opposition from countries like Germany, the powerhouse of the European Union, where they talk about the fact that this is not so much a, a, an issue around intellectual property constraints, but it's also an issue about countries not having the manufacturing capacity. They're not able to meet the safety standards that are required uh, uh, in terms of vaccine production. But this is also something uh, Dr. Ngozi uh, addressed. Let's watch. Trade regulations are critically important in the context of vaccine manufacturing and movement of vaccines. The, the urgency of addressing the crisis in access is re reflected in what you have heard of the proposal of South Africa and India for a waiver of the TRIPS-related measures uh, to allow for increased and diversified access to technology know-how man and manufacturing of, of vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics. They've talked about the sharing of IP. 
Um, I, this is a big debate uh, that is, as you know, raging at the WTO. And of course, as DG, I don't take sides. My aim is to bring members to the table so that we can have a resolution of this problem as quickly as possible. Uh, we have to do away with the reading of uh, statements to each other and actually sit down to try and negotiate. So a real big push by countries like South Africa and India to move these negotiations to text-based negotiations, so essentially where you can take out a line and put in a line and really get to the nuts and bolts of where we end up here. But I'll also just leave you, Francis, with some figures. Dr. Ngozi talked about the African Development Bank investing or making $3 billion available to African countries to shore up their manufacturing capacity. And why is this important? Because in the United States, 264 million shots have been administered already in South Africa, 430,000. We're at the back of the queue. And for any future pandemic, Francis, I'm sure we can all agree that needs to change. Yeah, not even at, at 1%. Thank you. Please uh, follow those negotiations closely for us live from New York. Show and Bryce, please.